That's it for upcoming uh, seminar announcements. Uh, it's a real pleasure to introduce Kevin Rowe again for his second uh, seminar. Kevin is no stranger to UC Berkeley. He received his undergraduate uh, degrees here. He did a major both in MCB and psychology. Uh, and then he did his PhD at uh, University of Illinois uh, and then did postdocs at uh, Florida State University and uh, uh, Southern Cross University before coming back to Berkeley uh, for a second time as a, as a third postdoc uh, where he worked on the Grinnell Resurvey uh, project uh, until he accepted his position um, in Australia uh, at Museums Victoria where he's on the faculty as the senior <coughs> curator of mammals. Uh, so as we heard on um, Monday, Kevin is uh, very interested in biogeography and systematics uh, of mammals, particularly in Australia and Indonesia, with a focus on murine rodents, uh, and is interested uh, in patterns of convergence across uh, um, uh, broad taxonomic scales. And so I believe today we'll hear uh, perhaps more about, uh, about this work. So please join me in welcoming Kevin for a second <laughs> talk. and a great introduction, so I don't have to say too much. Uh, but yes, today we're going to now talk about the value of collections for understanding historical change and how our work does that um, instead of just systematics and biogeography. Uh, and I was fortunate enough to, as a postdoc here, to work um, for the three field seasons on the Grinnell Resurvey, uh, surveying uh, the Sequoia regions, the central regions, uh, the southern regions of the, uh, the project. Um, and here's lovely Bullfrog Lake from the top of Mount Gould. Um, as we saw it in 2009, and as I think Dixon saw it in 1968. Um, as with all my work, it depends on a lot of people being involved, um, and the Grinnell Resurvey Project and other aspects of that Craig has been involved in, um, as Morgan Tingley and Adam Smith, who um, helped with a lot of the occupancy modeling and the climate modeling. Um, Karen has been involved in almost all the field work and spatial modeling associated with um, all the historical studies I'm going to show you today. Uh, and then in Australia, my work is um, uh, built a lot on partnerships with uh, members of Parks Victoria, um, our friend Ben Holmes here, um, the Department of the Environment uh, with uh, Nick Lehman here, and um, our friends at, at Zoos Victoria. And zoos in Australia um, are very much interested in the wild condition because their mandate for their captive breeding programs is to create healthy populations in the wild. And part of um, our partnerships have come out of a vacuum in any kind of monitoring that's going on in the state. And then uh, recently, Susan Perkins uh, has become involved in inspiring us to look at pathogens uh, and their historical change. Um, this work is also fueled by a number of people at the museum. Obviously, the Grinnell Resurvey Project was an all-museum kind of effort, um, a great uh, collaboration among people, uh, but then directly collaborated um, with Steve Feisinger and Michelle on publications, and Chris, both on the Grinnell Project and some work on uh, black rats that I'll talk about. Um, and of course, Jim Patton took me out on my first field trip in the, uh, the Grinnell Project to Young Lakes. And it's been said many times in here, this is normally how you see Jim Patton. Um, but less often, it's been mentioned that uh, he also requires cocktails on the veranda at the end of prepping each day. <laughs> Woe we tied the uh, young postdoc who's still prepping his chipmunk as the uh, sun is going down. Sorry for being slow, Jim. <laughs> So Grinnell is known for his prophetic quotes, um, and they're often cited here. He also wrote these prophetic quotes in 1915 about the demise of the collector, an article that he, an opinion piece he published in Science, um, in which he noticed the uh, uh, decrease in the number of collectors and argued that the value of collections um, adds sooner or later to scientific knowledge. I think these are all um, known and true to us. Fortunately, Grinnell wasn't um, terribly prophetic immediately in the decline of collectors. So this is a figure by Joe Cook from uh, the MSB, and he uh, um, allowed me to use it for this talk, showing the uh, number of uh, vouchers collected through time uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and here's uh, Grinnell in 1915, and fortunately still had a relatively linear increase in the number of collection growth. But now in our century, we are seeing this real and substantial precipitous decline in the development of new collections. Uh, in Victoria, um, Nick Lehman from the Department of Environment approached us soon after Karen and I arrived 
about pressure he was getting from agencies to not collect. And he wanted to be able to hand them a paper saying this is uh, the reason to collect. And we wrote a paper in our memoirs on uh, the values and impacts of collecting. Uh, and this is a figure that Karen generated for that uh, paper showing the spatial impacts of collecting through time for all the vertebrate collections uh, in uh, Museum Victoria. And so these are uh, 100 square kilometer grid cells showing the impacts of collecting. You probably can't read the number, but they range from zero white up to about 100 uh, specimens in really dark blue. And one of the conclusions of this is that the really intense collecting is around urban metropolitan development areas where we no longer have habitat and we otherwise have no way to, um, to dissect what was going on in populations there. We also look at the collecting through time. When we saw this big peak in the 70s which actually was driven by the Department of Environment and their surveys, which were used and in partnership with the museum to establish the national park system in Victoria. So there was a strong link to uh, the temporal component. Um, for some reason, birds were much better at their collecting through time. The other thing we did was just give some estimates of the impacts of the collecting um, compared to other impacts that are going on. So we are impacting the planet. People are uh, having massive impacts on populations, most of which the vast, vast majority of which are going undocumented. Um, and you put in the context of what other estimates are. Roads in Victoria are estimated to kill uh, 400,000 to 1.5 million uh, animals and wildlife per year. Duck hunters alone documented in 2012 killed 638,000 birds in one year. Um, and feral predators in Victoria are far, far greater than 1 million animals per year. And so this lovely uh, quote from Grinnell seems to stand out there. The present tendency towards extermination of the collector is close relationship to the increasing number of extreme sentimentalists. So we can't say that collecting needs to be curtailed because of the ecological impacts. We can only say that we're becoming sentimental about um, the lives of individual animals. So collecting is more important than ever, or as important as ever, and on Monday I talked about the value of new collections for new insights into a systematic understanding of life not just the naming of species and their relationships, but understanding their ecology and adaptation. Uh, and we also live in a time of uh, human impacts on the environment, and we talk publicly about this wonderful Anthropocene, and the geoscientists are defining this epoch. So it's clear to all of us the imperative to collect now um, is as great or greater than it ever was, um, and yet we're collecting far less. So, as you walked in here, most of you know these two quotes are out there. You've seen these quotes before, I'm not going to read them off. If you haven't read them, just walk outside and go read them. Um, but the first one is really about the need, the collecting, the need to collect is involved with the need to collect data, collect field notes and the metadata around that. And that's really what I'm going to talk about now. The second one, the prophetic quote that drove the Grinnell Project, um, and this, in terms of providing specimens to the student of future, will return to so the Grinnell Resurvey Project, the idea that we're going to go back to the sites where uh, Grinnell and team worked in the early 20th century and we're going to look at what changed, seems like a really simple idea. Um, but to really understand that, we needed to know, go to the field notes and figure out what they did. And so what did we really extract? Um, so Karen and I were involved in a lot of these, uh, looking through these field notes. Karen actually managed the, the field note mining for the Sequoia Park. Uh, and we mind over 15,000 pages of field notes <coughs> that are saying people really need to get about, get about 300 spreadsheets out of them. Um, and what did we really need to extract from that? We needed to extract where they went, their localities. <coughs> we also needed to extract what they actually caught. So for all his preparation, uh, Grinnell uh, prepped about 40% of what he actually caught. So here's just one example from a, a random field note. He caught four rhizodonomies, and then he prepped two of them. Um, and so if we just went to the, uh, the the specimen records, we would be missing a lot of the numbers um, of what was actually caught on those projects. The other thing that was really essential to being able to look at differences and to put in a statistical framework was to understand their effort. So how many traps they had, how many nights they were at, what their nightly capture record was, so that we could infer things um, about changes. And this is a paper that Adam Smith um, did based upon the mammal um, uh, occupancy records in which he looked at the ability to predict uh, species distributions using climate models between historical and modern eras. And the primary conclusion of that study is that the precision of the SDMs depended in large part on the quality of the absence data. So typically with SDMs and most things you're just using pseudo absences, you're randomly sampling from background to uh, get some confidence that 
where you didn't detect animals, they weren't there. Then there are low quality abscesses, place people did surveys and didn't catch an animal, but they don't know whether it was just not detected. And then uh, our occupancy model data, which always felt good to be called high quality absences, um, where we, we had gone and be confident that I would have caught that uh, retrodonomies if it was actually there. And what he found that there was any way you measure the performance of the SDMs, this is area under the operator of the receiver curve, uh, people aren't probably familiar with, or commission rates or omission rates, we always got better results or more accurate SDMs between eras um, when we had high quality um, uh, absence data. And so to get that, we need to get out on the ground and we need to record what we're doing out there. So record that with field notes. These are my first ever field notes. I was taught by Ned Johnson 104. This is my first 104 field notebook um, on how to collect field notes. And as Michael said today, what happens if you spill coffee on your field notes? Uh, computer. Well, I certainly did that on my field notes even as an undergrad. Um, and, you know, you can see my chicken scratch. It's always hard to decipher. And we got little insights from Ned, like uh, a male um, giving a uh, red wing blackbird giving a descending whistle call, which Ned pointed out was a hawk, and then we saw a hawk in a cypress tree. So that bit of insight has descended down to me uh, 15 years later. When I arrived and did the Grinnell survey, this is how we were taking our field notes, or I was taking my field notes, my catalog, again, with uh, my beautiful handwriting, uh, and then a journal, basically describing where we went and the effort we put in. And at the end of that first season, 2008, I came back with literally 1,000 photos like this. Um, and uh, I came back with my handwritten notes and my 1,000 photos, and then getting those into the collection <coughs> was um, nearly impossible. And I went to Jim and I asked how he, Jim Patton, I asked how he took his notes. And this is what he showed me, um, that he was creating these PDFs of notes, these beautiful maps so we could know where he went, the images embedded into the field notes, um, the trap results, and elsewhere showing his trap effort. All that data was right there. And as Michael said to me the other day, imagine if we could search the field notes. Um, and, well, you can search Jim Patton's field notes. <laughs> So I started started doing that as well, making these PDFs. I still kept this handwritten catalog, which Chris had to decipher my hieroglyphics and find my parts at the end. Um, but this link, and this is uh, one of the last sites I went to, Astor Lake, and we caught, we had one night just on this little boulder field beside the lake, and we caught two chipmunks, and here's the Tamius alpinus in my catalog, and here it is in the specimen record. But here we're getting, we get the locality, um, the effort, and the capture record one place. Well, then I moved to Melbourne and I didn't have a Chris Conroy to decipher everything I was doing and I had other uh, people trying to get the data in and so we started developing a way to collect all our data directly electronically um, and so we now record everything directly on the tablets um, and this is uh, uh, the locality field, the site record for this specimen uh, or for this, this system um, and so it has all the higher geography, the verbatim locality, uh, and then we can also attach photos to it and can record those photos and all their metadata. And any of this can be exported as spreadsheets. So we have locality data. Uh, we also have a collecting event field, which gives us all the effort data, so the different possible trap types we, ha we have out, and we can uh, record those, uh, maintain them uh, in a data format, and then, of course, we still maintain our field journals. So read about the um, exciting things that, that I do in the field, like leaving at 8.30 in the morning. Um, but these also give us the opportunity then to not just search the data, but to produce the data as spreadsheets. So this is uh, that mountain, all the collecting effort we put in on each trap line, on each night, each collecting event. So uh, we had 50 traps that we checked on the 16th of November last year, and we also removed those 50 traps That's at that same check. Um, and so instead of just having to re-enter the data, we can export it. Um, this is how we record our catalog now. It's a, a specimen record field, which then links to the collecting, <coughs> the capture record through the collecting event sites. Um, and we have all the kind of data and, and power in there. But another thing that's becoming increasingly important um, in our era is keeping track of parts. So we collect far more parts than we used to. Um, this is an example of an aeropeplus and some of its parts that I did for a public event, actually. Called Inside Out, so we brought us the insides out. 
<laughs> what we're learning from the insides of this rat, some of you may have heard about the diet work we're doing. Um, but this, this specimen has 13 different parts. And increasingly, in your national work, we're doing things where some of our parts are going to different institutions. So this one specimen has parts at um, uh, three different institutions, Museum Victoria, Museum Zoologico Bogorienze in Indonesia, and the American Museum of Natural History has some um, swabs for microbiomes that they took. And we can track all that in their locations in this database. Track it. That's all because we want to know things about uh, specimens, and, and we want to infer things about historical change. And we need to keep track of that data to make those inferences. So many of you are very familiar with the Grinnell Survey Project. We've, they've been, we've published on this, so I won't go into too much detail on it. But I'll give you an overview um, of some of the findings and how they lead into our, our recent work on distribution changes in Australia. So it's over uh, 15,000 pages of field notes and nearly 30,000 specimens of mammals um, from just under 200 or 300 sites. And from those, we were able to, we, did, we had 67 mammal species. But what was really interesting about the Cordell project is how much we winnowed data down. So all the data quality. So we had, then from that, we had 34 species that we could actually model um, statistically using occupancy models. So, all that, all that metadata and everything else, all those records, um, are really important to being able to get as much, squeeze as much data out of the, the stone of collections as possible. So one of the conclusions of that study was that, you know, we expect with observed climate change species should be moving up. Here's Grinnell's classic uh, life zones cartoon. Um, and in birds, it was a little uh, more variable and equivocal. But in mammals, there was a very strong signature, particularly among high elevation species that. When they moved, they shifted. Uh, <coughs> they, their lower ranges shifted up, um, and most of their shifts were either contractions. But and in low elevation species, it was pretty equivocal whether they were moving up or expanding or contracting. But this was basically naive to species. We were just counting up movements of, of range limits, um, and when we looked at the species and looked at them across <coughs> the three regions. Um, there was a lot of variation among the regions in how individual species responded. There was no species that responded the same on all three transects, um, and some species responded quite differently in different places. So this uh, rush tip of bushy tailed wood rat, um, which was completely stable uh, in the southern uh, in the Sequoia region, but had apparent major range collapses in Yosemite and Lassen. And so there was a very local effect some of the local effect going on. <coughs> and when Morgan and Karen and, and, and I had been toying with this idea of how we deal with local climate, and Morgan and his paper came up with this nearest neighbor analysis where he showed that precipitation might be actually pushing you to move down, whereas temperature is pushing you to move up, or local uh, effects might actually mean that even though overall temperature is warming, um, you might actually need to move uh, down and uh, downslope to get similar environments. And so it's a kind of complicated but really simple statistic just saying given a site and where it was historically, where are the sites on average that have similar climates in space? Are they upslope, are they downslope, and how far upslope they are? So these are the kind of predictions for all the sites in each of the, the regions and you can see that um, for precipitation in the southern Sierra many sites are downslope they might need to, to shift um, to get to a similar environment. This is all in those publications as well. But one of the sort of wrinkles of that as just was that we, there were climates that weren't available anymore. Um, they were not enough grid cells for us to even consider them. And so, because we were getting these spurious things where the model was predicting that they would move up 2,000 meters. And then when you look at where the climate was, it was just through this area of unavailable climate space. And it was very rare. It was just on the top of the mountain or something. And so in the paper, we had to just ignore these disappearing climates or these rare climates. They, maybe they were really, that site actually had a, a climate that wasn't really present in most sites in the historic area. And we ended up just kind of ignoring those, saying we don't have a way to deal with this. So Karen and I talking about this, Karen then looked at every site in the Grinnell survey and just asked these, how many of these sites are either disappearing or decreasing in climate availability or increasing in climate availability. And so there are sites that, like uh, Red Bluff from Lassen, which Jim and I just happened to be talking about the other day, um, and this happened to be in the slide, 
um, that this is the extent of uh, geography that had a similar climate for this variable, this is minimum temperature, um, in the Lassen area in the historical climate. But then in the modern climate, has not only has moved up and has also retracted. So it's, uh, half as many cells have this available climate anymore as, the, as it did in the historical era. And other sites where there's expansions of climate, so also in Lassen, mineral here, um, it's a historic climate and then expands into a much greater geography, three times as much geographic space with a similar climate. So when you, we look at that across, um, so look at only um, climates that are, con this is, yeah, when you look at all the sites, there are a number of, there's a histogram of different types of climate data. We see that there are substantial contractions uh, in, uh, especially in minimum temperature. So the 18.5% uh, of historical sites <coughs> have contracted an area by greater than 75%. So that they once were, could be quite common, and now are, are quite, quite rare. Precipitation was much less of a, a change in overall area available for the similar Sorry, expansions were much less across the thing in, uh, uh, in terms of their scope. So one of the things Jim used to always say is that Lassen is really different, the physiognomy is really different. Um, and this, when we looked at sites that were contracting, this becomes apparent. So this is the percent decline uh, for contracting sites uh, and plotted against elevation here. And so uh, in Yosemite, in central, you get this very very strong relationship between elevation and the amount of contraction. The higher up the mountain they are, the, the more contraction there is. Um, and uh, Sequoia is a little bit less. And Lassen, there's almost no relationship at all. The, the farther up you go, the, um, there's, a, not a, there's not a clear prediction of contraction. At very high sites that have almost no contraction. So again, this is about there are local processes going on. <coughs> And how do we tackle those local processes unless we get out on the ground and get more records to, to inform them? So, as most of you know, the Grinnelly Survey has moved to the Mojave, um, and Karen was part of the Mojave planning team that put together all the data in Mojave. And her and um, Adam and, and Morgan put together some predictions from that planning um, that they, they have in a um, draft manuscript. Um, and so here are the, here are the parks, um, draw from the region of the Mojave Desert. And one of the predictions they made was in the turnover of species um, given the changes in climate between the historical and modern. So these are based on ensemble models that Adam ran and, uh, and, and the uh, loss and gain of species in areas. And one of the predictions is that Death Valley would just have much more turnover than elsewhere uh, on the landscape. And so. <laughs> don't know, you guys are collecting data, so the question is whether that's actually coming true or whether we're actually sampling the sites that might show the greatest turnover. So another thing that these data allow us to do is think about where we should be collecting next. Not just where they went historically, but where are we missing with the historical record. So this is a climate uh, density plot. So the PC scores here are, are summaries of all of climate data and layers. Uh, and this is the distribution of climate uh, in the region versus the parks. So the region is in blue, uh, and the parks are in red, and then where they come together is kind of purple. Uh, and then the, the intensity of the hue, the saturation of the hue, is the kind of density of, of climate space samples that are there. And so this is the kind of outline of where the parks are, and this is the outline of where the, the region is and there's all this climate space that's missing. Uh, and then these are on the same scale. And so what's happening, what you also get to see here is that there's this climate space that was here that's now disappeared. Um, and, uh, and so do we have records from that that we can look to? That we have, do we have records currently that are projected to disappear into the future um, that um, allow us to test those predictions? So I mean, some of you may know that national parks about the time when Karen and I here were pushed under this idea of adaptive management. They couldn't just manage for the species they had in their parks. They couldn't just manage for the species <coughs> they had on this wetland. Or they had to manage for the species they might have there sometime in the future. And the parks came to us saying, oh, you're doing the Grinnell Survey Project. You can tell us what that is. 
and that's a really hard question about what they have to manage for. But we have to collect for thinking about where things are going to be, um, where things may not be, and where we predict they're not going to be, so that we can actually test those questions in 2050. Are we really going to lose it? Are we lose that climate space? And as Paul pointed out the other day, this is only climate. Um, there's a lot more to this. There's land use and vegetation, and Steve's group finally is doing some work on land use in the Central Valley that's um, showing some predictive capacity there. But, but there's more we can bring into these, these models here. But the, the big picture is that we need to think about where we're collecting in terms of where things are going to be. We need to think about collecting and what we're going to be asking uh, as the student of the future. So now we're going to move to the great country of Australia. Um, with its very different habitats and very different records of biodiversity. And the first um, example I want to start with, we've done very species-specific uh, work there because we don't have this great community uh, survey data available that we had in the Grinnell resurvey, so we've been looking at specific species. This is the broad-toothed rat, Mastocomys fuscus. I also like to call it the Australian lemming. So it's a murine <laughs> rodent that so you saw on Monday colonized from Asia through Wallacea down through New Guinea and finally got to Australia where it discovered wet meadows again uh, and got to become a bull or a lemming-like animal. It's called the broad tooth rat because it has these really broad molars um, and uh, violates some of the rules of molar development because it has enlarged uh, third molars that it uses to grind up its diet of almost exclusively toa grasses. So it's associated with cold wet meadows and some early climate models, just using basic bioclim, uh, suggested that from 2008 into 2050, we'd see uh, retraction of species up to high elevation sites on the mainland um, and near uh, extinction on the mainland. But when, we, when I arrived, we realized nobody had done a sort of review of the records in Victoria since 1971, um, and they hadn't really been thinking about it in terms of climate. So we then compiled basically all the all the specimen records from uh, ALAs, our museum database, Atlas of Living Australia, and the Victorian Biodiversity Atlas uh, database. And the circle sizes here are georeferenced uncertainty. So we looked at all possible service sites and then went to every site with a one kilometer extent or less. Uh, and what we found is that they were no longer present um, at more than half of the sites. And we had a repeated survey design. Uh, so we had, and we had really strong confidence in detectability. So uh, they weren't weren't there. They probably were absent, at least from that very local site. But we could really only go to the historical sites. Uh, and there was a strong correlation of persistence with <coughs> elevation, a really strong correlation with persistence and minimum temperature. Uh, and so this was consistent with these climate predict predictions that as we get warmer, this um, rat is going to disappear from the landscape. Uh, another native murine rodent uh, of Victoria, the smoky mouse here is a critically endangered species. Uh, it's found almost exclusively in Victoria. These are all its records um, on one map. Uh, and you can see this is not a lot of data to go by. A lot of them are pre-1980 uh, and then 1980, 1999. And we see disappearance. Um, come back. I'll see disappearance from their original description from the Alway Ranges. East Gippsland uh, and the ACT and Canberra region. We haven't seen them since the 1980s. And they remain basically in these strongholds, the Grampians in the west um, and the central highlands uh, here in Victoria. Um, and this slide, just to point out, they have this really kind of local distribution, but they live in very different environments in these areas. So we know very little about why they live where they do. So uh, here in the central highlands and into uh, southern New South Wales, it was strongly correlated with they're persistent on dry ridge lines. Uh, in East Gippsland, they're known from coastal sand dunes. Uh, and then in our work in the Grampians, we found them associated with wet forest gullies or the tops of mountains in subalpine snow gum forests. So why they are where they are is a big uncertainty. <clears throat> but it's also, where are they <laughs> on the landscape? If we dissect into the Grampians, uh, we arrived in 2012 after the break of the millennium drought, and we detected the first mice uh, in almost 10 years. Uh, in the Grampians and here in the Victoria Range, we had 28 mice, which was like the most mice anyone had seen in 30 years. Um, this is an area dissected by fire, so we've had uh, two fires since then, and we've had a big this Mount Lubra fire um, a few years earlier, so the whole area is being burned, um, and these mice are persisting. This is what our site looked like uh, after the burn. Uh, 
I won't go into that, but the mice did persist in it. So our question was really, we saw these 28 mice and the parks guys want to know, is this really exceptional site or is this just an exceptional year? Are they everywhere in the landscape? So um, my students spent time uh, trapping stratified throughout the Victoria Range, 50 sites, uh, and trying to find if they were even broader in this, this part of their, their distribution. And we found that they were completely restricted to an eight kilometer radius um, that was uh, the same kind of areas known from the historical record. But we also tested whether our ability to confirm absences. So our data, we could confirm absences, but we couldn't confirm absences from any of the historical data. So Victoria, like many state governments, now think that we can just do modeling to figure out where species are. And think about it, there was modeling, they want their model the smoky mouse, a species that we don't really know what its habitat association is, um, and a species that uh, distribution is changing, and a species to which historical record is based on lack of data to confirm absences. Um, and we've just gotten money from them now. They created this uh, ensemble SDM model, uh, predicting 900 sites uh, within 100 meters of a road for safety reasons uh, that we should go to and look. And so they're funding us now to go out and test if their models are actually valid. Um, and so we'll be setting up camera traps and live trapping to find out if they're right. But I suspect they're going to be wrong. And the reason I think that is another threatened species that we're working on, which is the New Holland mouse, Pseudomys nova hollandae. These are all its records here. It's the southeast Australia along the eastern coast down in Tasmania. Uh, these are its records in Victoria. Blue dots are extended <coughs> populations that my PhD student has been monitoring following. Red dots are populations where the species is no longer present. Some of them, like Anglesey here, uh, were long-term monitoring projects and they just they really watched the population disappear. So we're pretty <coughs> confident they're gone, at least from the specific sites where they worked. Interestingly, they collected living cell lines from these populations um, just before they winked out, so we have them now in our liquid nitrogen facility. But that's a different talk on genomics. Um, and with this system, we have been using their models. So these are using the same state modeling methods. So these include veg layers, these include fire layers, they include all the kind of information the state has to predict where the species is. The yellow triangles is where we knew the, the mouse was, and we have been working. The black dots are where the models predicted we should go, and we went, and not one of them produced a mouse. Um, and we have pretty high detectability for this mouse with our methods. So right now, these models are completely uninformative on where the species is. And they're being used to determine uh, development offsets. So if you want to build a, a Walmart, up there's Walmart in Australia, here, you can, build, you can set aside this land over here. And uh, yeah. There be no mice there. <laughs> okay, now I'm, I'm going to give you a little historical vignette on another, another Pseudomys. Uh, this is Pseudomys gouldi. Uh, it's an extinct <laughs> species of mouse. Um, there are 11 species of rodents that went extinct historically in Australia, um, a substantial proportion, um, <clears throat> and many have contracted the range dramatically. This specimen here was collected by great Victorian folk hero, Wilhelm Wandowski, the first zoology curator of uh, Museum Victoria. Um, and he led this expedition the same time that Wallace is traveling through the Indo-Malayan archipelago and two years before Darwin is publishing The Origin of Species. He led this expedition from the relative comforts of 19th century Melbourne into the arid interior of Victoria. And it was one of the first biological surveys of the uh, arid interior, and it's a big enough deal that in 2016 he got this beautiful monument of piled up stones <laughs> put in, in 2016 in a site where William Bondowski and actually Gerard Kreft, the botanist, deserves most of the credit because he actually kept the field notes that tell us about what happened. But on this, on this trip, uh, Bondowski collected at least 11 species of mammals that are either extinct completely or um, um, now, no longer found in the state of Victoria, like this pig-footed bandicoot, uh, one of the two extinct genera of mammals uh, in Australia, uh, and this lesser stickness rat, um, Leporella sapicalis. Uh, and Pseudomys desertor, which is still common throughout the central desert, but hasn't been reported in Victoria since 1857. And Pseudomys gouldi, named for the famous John Gould, um, and who was supplier of many specimens to Museum Victoria through purchase, including uh, over 200 Wallace specimens. Uh, and he also wrote these beautiful books on the birds of Australia and the mammals of Australia and his beautiful paintings, although most of the paintings were by Elizabeth Gould. 
so maybe this is really Elizabeth's mouse. Um, and here are the, all the records of that extinct species, uh, and here's Blandowski's specimen in the far northwest Victoria. And Jim, you might want to close your eyes, but then we uh, took this very rare and extinct species and, and sliced off um, about a mil, by a mil piece of its front paw. Uh, and this is, and then sequenced it using our exon capture system. And this is a very raw, rough tree that's just really come back in the last week. Um, and here's Pseudomys gouldi in a clade of Pseudomys fieldi. Pseudomys praeconis is a junior synonym of fieldi. But people still like you to test these junior synonyms and show that they really aren't valid. Um, and it's really close in here. And this is without cleaning up. These are our, based on fresh tissues. This is based on an 1850s skin. And it's got a tiny little branch length. And when we clean up the errors that are in the skins, those are going to be nested within Pseudomys fieldi. <coughs> And what does that mean about historical distribution change? So first there was a distribution of extinction. But here's Pseudomys field eye. It's known as the Shark Bay Mount because it was only known from a couple islands in Shark Bay. And then later people realized that this mouse was also found uh, around Owl Springs and was the same as the Owl Springs Mounts. Um, and so we now know Pseudo Pseudomys field eye's historical range is in the Central Valley. But adding Pseudomys gouldi into that expands it to the entire continent. And so you have a species that contracted to a single island Western Australia from a global continent. That'd be like saying Paramiscus maniculatus was only found on Catalina Island, and then looking back and finding out that it had this continental distribution. So field dyes, you know, under a management plan, is only listed as vulnerable and has no real reintroduction plan, but it was probably a huge part of this ecosystem. And hopefully this will move people to uh, uh, manage. Yeah, they're gone from, the, from all of mainland Australia except for that chart there? Yeah. Common pattern. In mammals of Australia. And now, for the really the greatest uh, mirroring of all, uh, the black rat here, <laughs> rats, rats, and a little transition to, so historical change is not only in declines of data species, but in the expansion of invasive species. Uh, and what's interesting about black rats is they're not really one thing. So Chris and I were part of a paper in 2011 showing uh, the expansion, there are multiple mitochondrial lineages within black rats. There's also multiple karyotypes that have expanded around the world. Uh, and this was a paper trying to work out the centers of origin of these different lineages. And black rats are now recognized as at least two species, Rattus rattus and Rattus tanzumi. Um, good luck telling them apart from the hand. Um, and subsequent work by Steve Donnellan, um, our collaborators, has now expanded the number of lineages to nine, has near global sampling of all lineages. And Chris got interested in this and, and recruited me into it because of this here. We had two, we have both blue and red dots here. The two main lineages, lineage one and lineage two, are found in the San Francisco Bay Area. And we did this work on uh, on looking at those populations. So we first showed the mitochondria nate. Both mitochondrial lineages are here. They're syntopic in, in Oakland and into Orinda. I think these are from Anita Pearson's house. It's one of the first things I trapped when I came here. Um, and these are, that's the map of the expansions from the paper. But we also then just looked at microsatellites for these two, and looking at these figures, the two lineages are completely overlapping. We force two populations on them. They're completely intermixed, so there seems to be no breakdown intergression between these mitochondrial lineages. But um, it's a really interesting system where we have <coughs> natural intergression hybridization happening. The expansion of black rats is, and effect on populations and health is a big area of interest. Um, and recently, they've been linked to the extinction of an uh, arguably Australian rat, politically Australian Christmas Island here, uh, which is um, overseen by Australia. And there are two native rat species there, Rattus nativitatus and Rattus mcleary. Uh, and from their discovery to their extinction was about a two-decade period. They completely disappeared rapidly, and we only had these few specimens, mostly in the British Natural History Museum. And a paper recently went to those specimens and sequenced them to see if they um, carried a trypanosome blood parasite. So this trypanosome lewisii is a parasite of black rats and other invasive rats, a pathogen that um, is now cause mostly causopollen distribution. Uh, and what the paper suggested is that uh, skins collected prior to the invasion of rattus rattus in the Christmas island did not have trypanosomes. And all skins after the rattus rattus had this trypanosome. Um, and it was a conjecture of the naturalists at the time because they had an animal that appeared to have trypanosomiasis, the, the pathological form of trypanosome, and it said, oh, 
I mean, it's just really just one line sentence. And uh, they knew that individual specimen, and they expected to find it in that, but they ended up finding trypanosomes in all of them. So now we're going to jump a huge geographic distance from Princess Island, Sulawesi, where Jim <laughs> and Rory and I have been working on this biodiversity inventory grant, I guess it's biodiversity data analysis grant now, um, and which Susan Perkins is involved. And so Susan got us motivated then to screen for blood parasites, uh, including malaria and including trypanosomes. <coughs> and we did this for the first time on the two mountains we surveyed in 2016. Uh, and uh, here they are, Mount Lapi Mojong, uh, north of the Tempe Depression, and Bald Frank, <coughs> south of the Tempe Depression. And when we looked at native rats, we found trypanosome, trypanosoma lewisii in them. Uh, and here, this is, we also found them uh, syntopic with ratus exulons at the very top of Bawa Karang. It's an alpine grassland that's impacted massively by local camping. There's huge garbage piles. And we hiked up through all this pristine moss forest catching only native animals and got to the top of this mountain at 2,800 meters and caught a bunch of ratus exulons living with the native mammals. And then that ratus exulons carried the identical haplotype to a number of infected individuals. The other thing that was apparent from this is that the trypanosoma that we were getting from Bawa Karang were reciprocally monophyletic trypanosoma from uh, Lapi Mojong, suggesting a separate geographic history. We also detected another species of trypanosoma in the clay Healeri. Healeri is known from gibbons in Malaysia and marsupials in Australia, so it has this Indo-Australian distribution already. We didn't know anything about it in between. But the phylogenetic pattern is completely different. It's geographically shared. There's geographic structure between the mountains, but there's no complete reciprocal monophyly. There's a lot of more diversity. Um, there's a lot of other metrics that suggest this is a long resident trypanosome. This is the native trypanosome of the populations. And this is the invasive, this is the historically invasive trypanosome that appears to represent two separate origins, um, so it were, suggests that there's two separate origins. The separate origin of um, Lati Mojong, where we don't, didn't have any um, invasive grass sequence, and Bawa Karang, where the sequences are identical or a single nucleotide different uh, from the copy in the uh, invasive rat, ratus excellence. While we were doing this, we also were getting some black rats out of our Smoky Mouse sites uh, in the Big Grampians National Park, and we screened them, and we found this same haplotype then in the black rats there, co-occurring with this critically endangered species in this kind of environment, this habitat here. Australia is really amazing in that invasive species invade intact environments. The cats are all through the wild environments. The house mice are all through wild environments. Black rats invade uh, wild national parks and environments. And they're interacting with the species. And right now, our technician is just screening the smoky mice um, to see if they carry the same trypanosomes infected from these black rats. But I like this last story because it says shows how a systematic view to collecting and to looking at species brings about these kind of serendipitous relationships, these serendipitous findings where because we're looking systematically at pathogens in Sulawesi and we're systematically trying to understand the range changes in smoky mice in Australia, we can bring those two together and um, you, know, you might think trypanosoma lewisii is really commonly detected uh, in Australia but it's only been reported uh, uh, once in black rats and so this will be the first record for Victoria of trypanosoma lewisii. Um, this, invasive trypanosome in Victoria, and if we find it in a dangerous species, it be the first record of that. So I hope you see that the value of collecting um, far exceeds the impacts, and that um, all, all collecting sooner or later uh, leads to scientific knowledge. Thank you very much. <laughs>
because I was dealing with, we're under the, we're audited by the Bureau of Animal Welfare, so it's a state agency that's actually overseeing us. And I call the head of, I talk to the head of wildlife in the Bureau of Animal Welfare about methods for collecting, because there's a lot of debate on methods of euthanasia. We don't want to know the convoluted ways we have to euthanize a Victorian native. Um, and his first response to me was, everything's going to be extinct in 100 years. Uh, why don't you just let it die in peace? <laughs> and so I think it's so much more than just humble. I think it's philosophy. I think there's a philosophy against harming things and hurting things, which is the extreme sentimentalist that Grinnell was warning, about, warning us about. Um, and it's not based on a rational philosophy of trying. We are hurting things. We are destroying environments and killing off billions of animals every year in the pursuit of our clothing and our everything else. And we're not doing anything to figure it out and figure out the impacts of it. Um, we don't. We don't take lightly a specimen. That's why we collect so many parts and we do so much to preserve the data around it because we want it to be valuable. I really think it's a, a, a large part of vacuum in philosophy around ecology and the study of ecology. To any extent, do you think the fact that some young people would think, well, all this collecting's been going on for years and I want to do something new, okay. would that be having an influence? I don't think these students know that collection's been going on for years. Everybody I bring into the, into the collections is just amazed that it's ever happening uh, and that there's all this diversity to, to look at. I think there is a movement towards collecting is old school and I'm going to do something more cutting edge and use more cutting edge technology. But I would argue that collections now, a lot, it used to be we were restricted by how hard it was to get a sequence or get technology or how hard it was to get morphometric data. But the, the methodological advances have made those the, actually the trivial part. And so now museums are in a really interesting position to say, <coughs> we can do all those cutting edge technologies on, in an integrated way. We can do the morphometrics, we can do the genomics, and we can do them our specimens, and we can do them on in a comparative framework. Um, so I, I, I think museums are going to be in a place of this uh, century where we are the new, we are the new cutting edge because we can the technologies are no longer hindering us in collecting that kind of data. Yeah. Um, regarding the like digitization of field notes, um, you had that one slide showing the uh, like digital way of inputting like specimens when you run an iPad. Yeah. Um, just curious, did did you guys what was that called? Did you develop it or was it? Uh, it's just FileMaker, a FileMaker database that we developed. Karen actually led the first development of that, um, and has a bird database and. Um, they're very, uh, they're just yeah, developed for ourselves. And we've tried to get other people to use them. So my colleague Jake Gustafson and LSU uses them. Um, everybody can modify it themselves. Every trip, actually, we have to modify it because um, we adjust the way we're, we're collecting things. Um, that's one of the challenges that because it's a separate database and you're constantly reinventing it, um, not reinventing it, but adjusting it, uh, it's hard to transfer new developments between FileMaker databases. That's kind of details of the database. It's a, a, just a kind of a historical comment as to why Grinnell wrote what he did about minimizing the collector in 1915. Yeah. And that's about the time the Seahart Merriam retired from the Biological Survey. The Biological Survey morphed into the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And so rather than having a whole cadre of survey people out, um, you know, tra trapping and so forth, that started to drop off. But the academic impact that Grinnell was having by shifting students to other institutions uh, to build these kinds of programs hadn't started yet. Yeah. I just wonder if that's what Grinnell was seeing. Because if you think about it from, from people our age, I mean, the 60s was the glorious decade of collecting in this country. Yeah, Australia was 10 years behind as the 70s. <laughs> yes, I, I think. Probably once every 20 years, someone writes that paper. Oh, the, it has. The you look at the literature data. that the, the okay. loss of collections. Well, about once every 20 years, that paper is written. And part of it is that museums, uh, I think, have not for a long time kept up with thinking really creatively about how to use their specimens, <coughs> how to use their collections, how to make themselves cutting edge. Um, we've changed that culture now. So the potential for that, I think, is there. The potential 
for doing things with collections with even sometimes without the specimen, but with the tissues and things would be there. And it's a lot easier to collect a rat than it is a bird these days. So sometimes. yeah, <laughs> sometimes. So we're we're constantly fighting the actual battle about the physical specimen. But I think we're getting better at that. Um, and we also have more collectors. You know, people are bringing stuff under the door, through the door to us. A lot of collections not coming in for certain taxa, you know, and, and in the way the traditional collector did. The challenge is making good use of those data in creative ways. Yeah, and the half our accessions is Melbourne and our donations. Exactly. Our exactly. Department of Environment. So does that mean your donations are going down? I don't know. Yeah, I mean, is when that why those collect those numbers are going down? I don't know. I don't have that statistic. I mean, Joe's includes all accessions. It's not just collections by biologists, but yeah. donations. But it is, a, it is the first time we have a paper with the on the twenty-year paper that has that actual yeah. precipitous line displayed in the yeah. statistics. The quality and extent of information it comes along with those donated specimens is about zero compared to yeah. what we generate when we're out there. No, that's true. But and sometimes again, we've been very successful so. developing partnerships with the Department of Environment, the zoo, and. Um, so we have a big marine mammal emergency response plan in Victoria that involves the Department of Environment, the parks, the zoos, <coughs> and us. And we were integral in figuring out the data. And now the zoos are the first uh, responders to animals that die, and they go and get a full necropsy. Uh, and then that data comes along with the specimen. And so we're actually getting far more data from those w whales and those cetacean, the marine mammal specimens, than we were getting when we just went onto the beach ourselves and took morphometrics. We get all the pathogen and uh, pathology reports, but most of the time it's true. We just the donors are you're lucky if you get locality data. Hey, I just wanted to ask. So you've done field work in Indonesia, Australia, <coughs> um, Western United States, and you've made a, a real um, passionate argument for the value of, of collecting. So, um, in thinking about, um, I mean, the world is a big place. How do you prioritize where? Uh, future collecting should be done? Is it in, in places that are already set aside, national parks, so that we're going to have a baseline for the future? Is it in areas where you know there's great biodiversity, in areas where habitat destruction is imminent? What, I think how do you think about that? I think prioritize collecting with research. I mean, I mean, I've talked to Jim about this before, but half the reason I have a research program is to um, make sure the collections I'm building are more valuable. Um, and so you have to have a start with a research question, and one of the research questions is like, how is climate change going to affect species? And so we can make climate models now that Grinnell couldn't do, and we can start to predict where should we go based on those models to make sure we're actually able to test those models in 20 years or in 30 years. Um, so I think there's not like a specific we should go to hotspots of diversity. Sometimes <coughs> people put up, oh, we don't have gen bank accessions from this area. Let's go there and get some tissues. I think that all good collecting. Is in the beginning based upon a research question. And Grinnell created his elevational gradients in the Sierras because he wanted to know about the ecological niche. And he wanted to know about the relationship between uh, climate and species species of distribution limits. And because that was rooted in ecology and the basic niche of a species, we then could understand how species changed with climate change he had no idea was going to happen. <coughs> okay. If there are no more questions, let's thank Kevin once again.